yourself. Sure. All right. Good afternoon. Welcome to our 1 p.m. session of the February 18th, 2020 study session. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Council members Watkins. Here. Matthews is currently absent. Brown. Here. Glover. Here. Crone. Here. Vice Mayor Myers is absent today and Mayor Cummings. Here. We only have one item on our agenda today, which will be the building electrification study session item. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions to, from the council. We will then take public comment and then return for deliberation. And so I'd like to turn it over to Tiffany Wise West, Sustainability and Climate Action Manager, and Kurt Hurley, Green Building Specialist. Thank you, Mary. Good afternoon, uh, council members and mayor. Uh, as the mayor stated, I'm Tiffany Wisewest, the Sustainability and Climate Action Manager. And seated to my right, right here, is Kurt Hurley, our Green Building Specialist. And we have been working since you directed us to do so on bringing back some options for you to consider. So let's jump right into that. We have a lot of material and we're very thrilled uh, to be able to share with you our progress today and um, also to bring into the conversation some stakeholders in our community. So in terms of what we would like to cover today, we do have, uh, as I said, quite a bit to cover. Um, we have a presentation that will take place by, uh, or Kurt and I will present to you. We will also hear from Monterey Bay Community Power uh, as they are a key player uh, in building electrification. Um, we also have uh, Amy Ryder, who is the acting direct policy director of the Building Decarbonization Coalition, who will be um, talking about what other jurisdictions have done in the state trends. We have a couple builders and designers that will be here to talk from their perspective about building all electric buildings and their cost effectiveness. And then we'll bring it back to really talk in detail about the policy options that we've developed for your consideration based on all of this research, what other jurisdictions have done, speaking with other jurisdictions and understanding um, what their challenges were, what they might have done differently at this time and place. And then we will have time uh, for Q&A from you, the council, um, as well as public comment. And then uh, we would like to get clear direction from you on which option or options you would like to see us bring back um, for uh, a public hearing, which we're anticipating will be March 24th. So with that said, um, we have four key objectives um, that we'd like to achieve through this study session. Uh, first of all, we want to provide an overview on building electrification concepts and their drivers. Uh, this topic can get uh, difficult very quickly, complex, and we wanna make sure that um, you have a full understanding of why uh, we'd like to do this and um, what the considerations are. We will share two policy options um, for you to consider um, and the background as to how they were developed, as well as uh, a timeline for or potential adoption of one um, or more options. Um, as we said, we'd like to receive feedback from city council and the public and answer questions. Um, as you'll see later in the presentation, we have been doing extensive outreach with the community on this particular point um, to refine and hone what we're doing. And then again, we wanna receive direction from council on how you would like to proceed. So to start, you know, there have been a number of um, resolutions that have been adopted recently, uh, including the climate emergency resolution from 2018, as well as the Green New Deal from 2019 that really call for accelerated action and priority in greenhouse gas emissions reduction. This building electrification effort uh, really aligns uh, with both of these uh, policy positions. And also, as you will see later on, because we are public, uh, in addition to greenhouse gas emissions, we are pointing to uh, public safety and indoor air quality. Truly, this is an operationalization of our new health and all policies framework as well, where we are prioritizing equity, public health, and sustainability. And so you will see um, us touch upon those points throughout the presentation. 
One thing I think that's really important um, to mention at this point is that, you know, some jurisdictions have gotten questions as to why not wait for the next code cycle, which would happen in three years or in six years. But as we know and as articulated in these various resolutions and in our um, IPCC uh, Intergovernmental Panel uh, on Climate Change, we know that we have 10 years or less to really get things under control. So waiting three to six years, in our opinion, delays um, our action, whereas we can take action right now. So I think it's, it's important to mention that. So what are the drivers as to why we're exploring uh, electrification? Council, you all directed staff to bring back options uh, last fall and align our timeline with Monterey Bay Community Power's rollout of uh, support incentives. And we have done that, and you're going to hear more about that uh, shortly. MBCP's uh, electrification strategic plan also calls for transportation and building electrification as key emissions reduction strategies for our region and the incentives that they are coming to. Also, although we have not adopted a carbon neutrality um, target year in our jurisdiction, we are working under the assumption that it will be 2045 or earlier as per the state's uh, target for carbon neutrality. This piece will certainly be a major component of us being able to achieve our contribution to the state's carbon neutrality target. And I've already mentioned a couple of these uh, resolutions. Incidentally, um, well, this will be the next slide, I think, yeah. Okay, and speaking to uh, California's goals, you know, over time, California has um, adopted a number of aggressive goals and targets. If you see, look in the lower left-hand corner, AB 3232 specifies a 40% emissions reduction in buildings. Um, so this building electrification effort gets to the heart of that in addition to a number of these other um, policies uh, that uh, the state and targets, I should say, that the state uh, has adopted. Um, one other incident incidental uh, policy that uh, has been adopted is that um, California state law has uh, provided national leadership in the fuel efficiencies of vehicles and buildings. And for the first time, the International Civil Aviation Organization instituted civil aviation fuel efficiency standards for 2020 for new aircraft and 2023 for aircraft designs already in production. So we're gonna speak a little bit towards transportation, but our focus today really is on building electrification and we'll show you why in just a moment. With that, I'm gonna hand it off to Kurt Hurley. Good afternoon, Mayor Cummings and Council. And I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to the members of our community that are here for this study session on building electrification. I'd like to begin with a quick review of the city's existing green building program. It served our community for over 13 years since 2007. It's a program of considerable breadth. It allows for the reduction of water use, improved indoor environmental quality of buildings, reduction in the supply chain impacts of construction materials, and reduced maintenance costs. With the updated program that was just published last month, there is a new emphasis. So there is a opportunity to educate our design professionals and designers to create optimum all electric designs and those existing structures also to guide them in the path of fuel switching towards electric appliances. I'd like to spend a few moments reviewing the building codes and the process by which our city adopts building codes. So generally we begin with a national model code and those are adopted by counties and cities. Today we're gonna to be talking about our California's Title 24, Part 6 and Part 11. Part six pertains to the energy performance of buildings. Part 11 has a broad environmental coverage and has content regarding building to vehicle connectivity or also known as B2V. What's the process for building code adoption? Well, there's triennial updates to the international and the national model codes and our city adopted the 2019 building code cycle in November of last year. The next code update will be the 2022 code update and that will go into effect January 1st of 2023. 
So cities have the opportunity to adopt the codes as they exist and also to make local revisions as deemed fit to the climactic, geological, and topographical conditions in their regions. We'll touch a little bit more about the process later, but revisions to the energy code must be required, uh, approved by the California Energy Commission, and those amendments filed with the Building Standards Commission to become enforceable. Finally, at the bottom of this slide in brown, we'll mention the municipal code uh, of our own city, Title VI, Health and Sanitation, we'll be discussing a possible amendment to that. So now let's drill down a little bit into the CalGreen, Part 11, and the Energy Code, Part 6, and look at how those codes changed from the last cycle, the 2016 cycle, to the 2019 cycle, which is in, uh, in place today. On the far left, we see the, in the, for the rows, we see building electrification, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and solar PV. So coming out to the middle column for 2016, those, those two codes had really no content towards building electrification. If we move down now to electric vehicle charging infrastructure, the 2016 CalGreen, that's part 11, had the provision to for designers to designate parking spaces as EV capable and an empty conduit through which an electrical conductor could be placed at a future time to serve electric vehicles. And finally, provisions for solar in the 2016 CalGreen code uh, and energy code required solar readiness. So that would, uh, that would be defined as a certain area on a rooftop that was designated and available for solar access at a future time. Now switching to 2019, there's a change. We now have not a requirement for an electric water heater, but readiness in the building uh, electric delivery system and other components. So at some point in time, a building owner in the future could readily switch fuels and use an electric water heater. The electric vehicle charging infrastructure, the B2V, has remained the same. And finally, in the lower right square or rectangle, I should say more correctly, is a big change. So our energy code for 2019 has a requirement for photovoltaic panels for low rise residential defined as three stories or less. There are some exemptions, exemptions uh, relative to solar access and otherwise. So that gives us a good overview of uh, the immediate past history. So let's talk a little bit about a REACH code. Before we talk about a REACH code, let's, let's quickly review the definition and the, the purpose behind the California Building Code, which is to determine the minimum requirements to protect <coughs> public health, safety, and the general welfare. So if a region, a city, or a county <clears throat> goes beyond those requirements, that would be known as a REACH code. Now, there are many categories or requirements that a REACH code can pertain to. Our own, in our own city, through, through a parking public works uh, effort, we actually augmented the EV charging requirement that was specified by CalGreen so that there's actually infrastructure and a greater uh, percentage of spaces available. So our city already has uh, made some efforts in this fashion, and it was actually done in a way that the CalGreen code was not amended. So <clears throat> we covered the base code and, and some of the categories, water efficiency, energy efficiency, building electrification, our topic this afternoon, and renewable energy. I want to cover in this slide the legal requirements for a, a local jurisdiction to create an energy reach code, so an amendment to the code that we adopted in November of 2019. There are three legal requirements. The amendment must prove to be cost effective based on the Energy Commission's own economic analysis. There must be at least one path provided which does not <coughs> preempt federal appliance efficiency standards. And lastly, the amendment may not allow building designs which exceed the energy budget for the base code, right? So we can't, we can't actually 
create an amendment that says, well, we can do worse than what the state requires in the, in the, in the base or vanilla code. Now, before we move on to the next slide, let's take an opportunity to understand the cost effectiveness determination that the Energy Commission uses. So for the last 15 years, corresponding to the last, last six code cycles, there is a life cycle analysis of saved energy versus the incremental costs for building efficiency. It has to show that those incremental measures actually pay for themselves over that 30-year period. Now, in the case of the 2016 Energy Code, those features that were required by the code uh, were an additional incremental cost of $2,700, but saved the homeowner $7,400 over a 30-year period. I, I don't know about anyone else, but I've, I've certainly made some investments <laughs> that didn't do as well as that. So uh, just, just wanted to uh, give you that example. We're now going to review the code adoption process. And I'm going to direct you down to the, the purple arrow on the bottom of the slide. So we begin with analyzing the cost effectiveness studies that have been performed on various types of structures and conducting outreach, understanding what other jurisdictions have done, understanding the uh, scope in our own city and how that can, compares and contrasts with other jurisdictions. Preparing a staff report and supporting documents. Uh, then the process would move from a first reading to the adoption of the ordinance and a second reading. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there is approval. We have to submit our documents and our, our basis and findings to the California Energy Commission for our code amendment. And finally, after that approval, the California Building Standards Commission, we would file it with that for it to be enforceable. If I might interject here, you'll see that the last two uh, items on the far right hand side of the uh, purple arrow are kind of swapped out in the bullets. And actually at that phase in the process, it doesn't matter if the city adopts first and then it goes to the CEC or the CEC approves first and then it goes to the city for adoption. So I just want to clarify in case you noted that there is a little bit different order in those last two. Well, at this time, I'd, I'd like to hand this off to J.R. Killigrew. He's Director of Communications and Energy Programs at Monterey Bay Clean Power. Uh, thank you very much, Kurt. Um, it's an honor to be here, uh, City of Santa Cruz. It's still Monterey Bay Community Power, but I do have to note that um, we soon could be Central Coast Community Energy as we are expanded down to San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara. So we have now unified the Central Coast under one banner, Community Choice Energy Agency. I'd just like to acknowledge Council Member uh, Brown who's been servicing on our, on our policy board as well as City Manager uh, Bernal on our operations board. So it's great to be here and to discuss why electrification. Um, for folks in the room who uh, may be puzzled by us or haven't heard about us, hopefully at this time uh, you have heard about us but still to this day, um, there are questions about who we are. We are your default electric service provider. So we partner with PG&E. We go out and source the electricity on your behalf, and then PG&E does the, uh, the, the delivery and the billing. Um, we have been hugely successful the last two years since we launched, and I know the city of Santa Cruz still maintains one of the highest enrollment uh, uh, rates out of all of our service area, about 97%. So we applaud the city of Santa Cruz for all your leadership. Uh, but most importantly, um, we're here to advocate for this transition to electrification. Um, as, a, as a public agency that's here to, to, to serve the public, to provide resources and opportunities based on our Joint Powers Authority goals, um, we truly believe that electrification is that course of action that every city or county has to take, as well as every individual, whether you're resident or business, to move us towards this carbon-free society that we're all striving towards. Um, so we really see this as paramount but we also have to do this in an equitable and cost-effective way. This isn't something that is just for <coughs> folks with means. We have to make sure that this electrification happens for uh, constituents from all income levels. So I just want to um, make that, make that um, known that um, as we develop programs and we invest in the, in the Central Coast, we want to do that through the lens of equity as much as possible. Uh, the one great thing that I do like to uh, note is that 
We now uh, deliver a savings on a monthly basis. So if you're consuming electricity, you're saving about three, a little over $3 a month for an average residential customer. And that increases every month based on consumption. Um, the great thing is, is our, our discounts have, have, have increased year over year since we started service. I think this year in 2020, we're estimating delivering almost $20 million of bill savings in 2020. To date, we delivered about $18 million of bill savings in 2018 and 2019. So when folks are worried about, is electrification gonna be more expensive? Well, if the status quo was you just had PG&E for your full bundled service and you were moving towards electrification, it would be more expensive. But now that we're here, we're helping to drive down that cost on a monthly basis. So we, when we make that switch, you're gonna be paying less than you would be with the incumbent utility. Um, as uh, staff has mentioned, um, we embarked on an electrification strategic plan. And again, this is more or less a roadmap for us to kind of get our bearings about what does the Central Coast look like in terms of housing stock, vehicle stock, you name it. And our real core focus was on the built environment and the transportation <coughs> sector, because those are the two sectors of our economy where we can have kind of significant influence, as you call it. You know, we not so much around waste and other kind of forms of monitoring greenhouse gas emissions, but as an electric utility, our, our basis is all about kilowatt hours. So we want to focus on that in the built environment, the transportation sector. Um, so we had this uh, great plan that we had adopted late last year, and all the tasks kind of roll into this kind of guidebook for, to inform how we're gonna invest our program dollars. So right now, 4% of our annual revenue gets carved out and allocated to our programs. Um, and so as our revenue increases, that program uh, uh, budget increases. So right now we have got about $4.3 million available for energy programs that we've already had um, kind of uh, deliberation about where the money's going towards. But as we start expanding, resources, that will become even more and more. We're trying to just get out the gate, deploy our resources uh, effectively, get some success, and then start increasing that budget so we can kind of deploy these resources across our service area. Um, but what we did find in the, uh, in the electrification strategic plan was that, you know, while 82% of the emissions that come from whether the built environment or the transportation sector come from vehicles, we still found a lot, a fair amount coming from the built environment. And that comes from whether it's propane use or natural gas use in the built environment. And you'll see the, the pie chart that's even more broken down. We actually analyze all the different types of kind of uses of, of energy in the built environment. And we saw a very interesting mix of where the consumption of natural gas or propane is coming for. So it's a pretty kind of equitable split um, in that sense. But what it does allow us is visibility into where we can kind of dive in and start uh, investing in in, in programs to really make this change. The other thing that we also notice in this report that's not here is the opportunity of propane to electrification is huge because that's one of the most cost, of way, cost effective ways to do it. We've actually identified pockets of Santa Cruz County that have a high saturation of propane use, and that could be another opportunity for us to make that transition to electrification, especially in those hard to reach areas. Um, so what I did want to mention is right now in our in our budget for programs, we, we focus on kind of three core tenants or sectors, transportation, electrification, building electrification, and then community resiliency. But we're here to discuss about reach codes and building electrification. Um, so right now we have, uh, we have three programs that we're developing that we have approved budget for. One is actually really exciting. The first one is to provide incentives to our member agencies. So right now we have uh, 20 21 member agencies across Santa Cruz, Monterey, San Benito, and now the cities of San Luis Obispo and Morro Bay. We actually have 11 more member agencies on our respective boards, but we haven't enrolled those customers yet, and we're gonna do so in 2021. But the point of this uh, reach code incentive is to provide an incentive for our member agencies to bring forth and adopt a reach code. And so what we're evaluating is it's kind of based on the housing stock. How much housing stock are you gonna bring online over the next kind of 10 to 20 years? And what are the avoided emissions that come from an all electric building stock? Because one of the most effective and affordable ways to reduce emissions in the built environment is to not put any of the gas lines in or anything like that from day one. It's extraordinarily ex uh, expensive 
expensive and, and challenging in the existing built environment to get into people's homes, to do panel upgrades, all that kind of stuff. So we wanna approach it from two perspectives, which is one, supporting our member agencies to galvanize and support reach codes um, at the municipal level, and then help with incentives to move the market and get it moving that way. Um, this one I'm, I'm super excited about. Uh, this had been kind of a dream of mine. Um, I actually came from the first CCA that started up in Moran MCE, um, and I had all this wild ideas about why not do grants for uh, developers, whether they're affordable or market rate, so that they don't put any gas lines in their new construction. And gratefully enough, MBCP kind of saw that as a good opportunity. So right now, uh, we are developing the program. We're getting dangerously close to providing the incentives. So we'll have incentives for affordable housing developers and incentives for market rate developers. So the total budget will be $1.2 million, and it'll be a grant program. Basically, developers, whether you're Eden Housing, Midpen, Chispa, we've talked to a, a lot of the great developers developers in our region to kind of understand and help inform the program, um, as well as market rate developers. So we're, uh, we're kind of tracking for, if not in April, but maybe very early May launch. So that's when the grant application would go live and the developers would apply, and then hopefully we would have those funds reserved within this year so that they can move towards and it basically what it does is we found that a lot of the developers were still entertaining you know, hybrid uh, new construction systems. So it would have gas lines and electric, and electric. so it'd be a hybrid system. And what we found with even with this incentive, which isn't gonna amount to a huge amount of money, but at least it got them thinking about redesign and thinking about going all electric. So we do believe that incentives will help kind of guide the developer community in the right direction. And, and the goal for us is to have this program go on for a few years and to expand maybe the volume or the amount of money, but maybe reduce the, the incentive each year as you get more uptake. Because what we're seeing is there's a lot of development that's not only happening in the Monterey Bay region, but also down in San Luis Obispo and as well as Santa Barbara. And our, our service area, will be 8,000 square miles, 32 jurisdictions, and, and 430,000 430, customers by mid next year. So we've got a lot to do, but we also truly believe in the leadership of the city of Santa Cruz to help kind of move this approach forward because if we can replicate the model that's being done here, we can certainly take that to our other jurisdictions and, and, and stand you folks up as that leader to kind of galvanize the Central Coast around building electrification. Um, Last but certainly not least, I did want to mention that while we're focusing on reach codes and new construction, we are going to look at helping uh, homeowners um, to electrify their homes. And the, the first shot is going to be a package program where we'll provide incentives for heat pump out water heaters, home EV chargers, and if you need a panel upgrade, some funding to help that. That is the biggest challenge to a homeowner right now is having adequate space on their panel or an adequate panel to get the new appliances. There also is the challenge of the transformer, but at least we can identify and help lower the cost for adoption um, at, the, at the customer level. And if there are those added kind of infrastructure needs, then at least the cost is being mitigated to some extent. Uh, but I think the benefits, again, safer and healthier homes. I don't think we can talk about that enough. The fact that with electric homes, electric appliances, they become safer, better air quality, especially with some of the issues that we're dealing with from time to time about air quality. Why not make your home as safe and healthy? And that is the most important thing no matter what. Like to be able to have an electrified home that becomes a safer and better environment for yourselves and your kids or your pets or whoever else is living there. Um, and on that note, I think I can turn it back to staff. Thank you so much, JR. We really appreciate that. Okay, we're gonna continue on a little more specifics on why electrification. Um, as this slide uh, shows, over 70 million homes and businesses in the US burn fossil fuel on site for space heating and water production, so hot water production. So that's really what we're talking about here. Um, in California, 25% of overall emissions are from buildings. And as we saw in our region, when we're talking just about transportation and built environment, about 18%. So that's really the, the thing that we're going after here through building electrification. And just to show you, this is uh, California, in California gas use in homes and how that is proportioned out. And and again, you really see what we're trying to go after here, which is water heating and space conditioning. Um, 
and there are alternatives to natural gas. And Kurt's gonna be talking a little bit more about that in a moment. But another thing that we wanna point out is not only is there on-site combustion that we're concerned about, and we're gonna talk about some of the indoor air quality issues, but there is also leakage across the supply chain for natural gas from extraction, which you can see on the right-hand side, all the various uh, repositories of natural gas and fracking, the leakage rates that accompany those. And that leakage is meth methane. Methane is significantly uh, more stronger of a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So the leakage is a big point here, and you can see in the uh, graph on the left-hand side, which is the U.S. Uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions inventory, uh, the far right-hand graph shows that there's a 24% increase um, in uh, carbon dioxide equivalent that's released simply from that leakage. So that is substantial. Okay, some of the benefits of electrification are not just around emissions, and we're gonna go over some of these in, in more detail than others. Um, in, uh, in terms of superior of comfort, um, occupants of buildings have found that uh, electrified buildings that are heated by um, heat pumps for space conditioning are uh, superior in that they are very quiet, they provide constant heat, and there are not intermittent blasts of hot and cold um, like conventional gas furnitures, uh, uh, furnaces, excuse me. Um, we're gonna go over some of these other ones uh, in a little bit more detail. With respect to uh, public safety, you know, as I mentioned, this leakage is already happening. That was the cause of the San Bruno fire where an ignition spark ignited leaks. And so we have seen that across the US and eliminating natural gas infrastructure or minimizing natural gas infrastructure will eventually mitigate this legacy uh, infrastructure that uh, utilities like PG&E have that cause these kinds of catastrophes. Also, with respect to indoor air quality, there are a number of uh, toxins and chemicals that are released through combustion, and uh, air pollution levels in 55 to 70% of homes would actually be illegal if they were outdoors. There is no indoor air quality regulation, but if that air quality was outdoors, which is regulated, it would actually not be in compliance. <clears throat> and really to hit that point home, um, we uh, discussed this supper smog when folks are, are everyone's cooking and you can see on the, on the right hand scale, um, if, you're, uh, if you're preparing one dish uh, in an, on an electric cook stop, uh, cook stove rather, um, you are below 2017 outdoor air quality standards, but as you look at preparing one dish in a natural gas fired uh, stove or, or a cooktop or a full meal, you are far exceeding uh, outdoor air quality standards. And there have been a number of studies including in the lower right hand corner, California's Air Resources Board um, that finds that indoor air uh, due to combustion is uh, of poor quality. I'm gonna hand it over to Kurt to talk about the, um, the dollars, cost effectiveness. Thank you, Tiffany. Uh, I just wanna add, uh, she's uh, wrapping up the health concerns about combustion appliances. In the last five years, there was peer-reviewed medical research that indicated that for women in a late-term pregnancy, up to a 60% increase in the, in the probability of a miscarriage with one acute carbon monoxide exposure. So I, um, I've shared some of that information with colleagues and as uh, I visit projects, so just also wanted to add that. So in this slide, we're, we're going to take a look at the transformation in the built environment. On the left, we see are two um, trends and how together they're going to result in a lower energy intensity in the built environment. Now the numbers at first are a little bit puzzling because we're suggesting here on the far left an increase in electricity consumption of say 30% resulting in an overall, uh, say in the high teens, reduction in total energy intensity. And you might ask, well, how is that possible? That math doesn't seem to add up. 
It has everything to do with this. The appliances that are on the market today, even just five years ago, are, are of such uh, better performance in using uh, an electric approach for either heating water or heating the air in our buildings that th they are really driving this transformation. Fundamentally, the gas appliances in, of, of legacy that we are used to use a combustible fuel to create heat energy where it's needed, either to warm water or the interior air of our buildings. So with the new electric technologies, no new heat is created. Simply the ability to take existing heat energy from the interior and bring it inside or take unwanted heat energy from the interior and remove it to the exterior at will. So that's really the, the transformation in the appliances and the engineering that has achieved these milestones that is allowing this overall reduction by fuel switching away from fuels which create new heat towards heat pump technology which simply conveys heat from interior to exterior or vice versa. So I'd like in this slide to go through four different windows through which we can look at the, uh, the, co the, the cost effectiveness of electrification. And, and just before we start, in the next two slides we're reviewing the cost effectiveness of the structure on its own, the avoided costs when we look at the infrastructure, the utility connections, which would be the structure plus the site, and then we can drill in in the third and fourth windows on the present price of fuel and the projected future price of fuel. And so as we move through this slide, I just want to remind that, uh, that we have those four windows to look at the economic implications of what we're proposing. So let's begin with sort of the broader uh, picture, which is this, the cost of the structure and the services that are uh, required. And again, we're, we're confining ourselves to newly constructed buildings. So say we have a lot, it's going to require new electric and gas service. If we pursue an all electric approach, we still need the electric service, more of it, but we avoid uh, which according to PG&E's own information, up to 15, in excess of $15,000 for a new gas meter and a new gas lateral. Uh, now the California Energy Commission's primary <coughs> investigator for their uh, cost, uh, life cycle cost uh, metric also studied the cost impacts of electrification. For San Jose, there was a $12,000 net savings for an all electric design new single family dwelling versus mixed fuel. And let's also pause for a moment in building our definitions for today's uh, study session. When we refer to mixed fuel, we mean a new building design that still pursues the use of natural gas with electricity for plug loads. All electric would of course be everything electric. I think JR used the term hybrid and I'll continue to use the term mixed fuel. So as we're reflecting on this first uh, cost avoidance. I, I want to just uh, reflect also on a statistic uh, from the National Association of Home Builders, which indicates that across our country, for every $1,000 increase in the price of a home, that's another 9,800 families that can't afford it. So there's a considerable cost sensitivity. So all electric designs afford the opportunity to potentially create more affordable housing in the supply of new buildings that are available. Now, let's, let's move on and, and consider something that is incredibly intriguing when we reflect on uh, the absence of this information if we're going into a rental agreement or we're looking to buy our first home or, or maybe our second home. <laughs> and that is the projected on-bill utility savings based on the design of the home. So in the cost effectiveness studies that I have been analyzing and I've shared with my colleagues, the Energy Commission has a methodology which uses a metric known as TDV. We look at a 30 year period. We look again at the incremental costs, a slightly more efficient water heater, better windows, more insulation, a radiant barrier in the attic to reflect the infrared energy that normally would escape. When we look at the analysis, we look at the cost of those features and also the savings and any maintenance costs of applying that 
slight change in that building system. So with the reach codes, we have even a higher bar to reach, which is not only using the TDV metric, but looking exactly on utility bills, which is, is what we're talking about here. So all of the measures that we'll be talking about later today are specifically for our climate zone demonstrated to be cost effective, which is to say that both using the TDV metric and the utility bill metric over a 30 year period, the savings exceed the incremental costs to make the building more efficient, either through an envelope measure or a more efficient appliance. Now, before I move on to the next window, I, I want to reflect on the fact, again, that for a renter or for a home buyer, this disclosure of energy use intensity is really a black box. And it's, it's extraordinary because, you know, if we were to go out and buy a, a vehicle, even a used vehicle, we would have some inkling as to the fuel efficiency. In the built environment, we're slowly getting there, but particularly for residential structures, uh, it, it's just not something that the consumer uh, has as a disclosure. Now, with the addition of solar, solar PV, there's an, there's an additional savings, and why is that the case? Generally, a high quality photovoltaic array is going to last in excess of 20 years. It pays itself off at approximately year seven, meaning that for every dollar spent, we're gonna get that dollar back and another $2. So its net present value would be $2. So for an average home with the average size array, there's an additional uh, yearly savings of approximately $500. So I wanna move on now to the uh, third and fourth windows I was talking about, which were looking at the fuel, comparing the, the price of fuels. So I first of all, wanna spend some time looking forward. So again, uh, E3, the primary investigator for the Energy Commission, has done an update to their life cycle impacts metric. So if we look at the projected compound annual growth rate for electricity versus gas, huge difference. 2.7% for electricity and 4% for natural gas. So if we fast forward to the year 2030, the $1,000 that I'd be spending today in this year, 2020, would would, would be over $1,300 for the electricity, but approaching $1,600 for the natural gas. So again, if, if we're creating particularly new rental units, um, there's gonna be a increased erosion of disposable income with uh, staying with the <coughs> mixed fuel design. Now, I, I also have a story. I've been reading a lot of cost-effectiveness studies uh, but sometimes you know, you're, you're, just, you're digesting a lot of economic and technical and policy or legal information. I have a story to tell you. Uh, part of my work with the city is I'm a field inspector. In the last 12 months, I've uh, performed over 120 inspections. It was just last month that I learned something quite extraordinary that relates to the cost effectiveness uh, study session that we're conducting today. And that is that for multifamily new developments, the utility provides the developer a per unit credit towards the labor, the materials, and the non-recurring engineering. So I mean the engineering that would look at the adequacy of the, the distribution electric circuits and, the, and, the, and the, the nearby large gas lines. And so sometimes, and it's gonna depend on the location, uh, there's a very minimal cost, or maybe it's entirely free. It's gonna depend on the location of the development. So this is information that I didn't encounter anywhere in any of the cost effectiveness studies that looked at the avoided costs. So the whole site with the new building. And it's quite significant and, and quite interesting. So I'd like to move on now. And I, I was talking about the projected annual growth rate in the different types of fuel. I now wanna take a moment to reflect back on six years of data between 2012 and 2018. Over that time period, gas, the, gas, the price of a therm of natural gas increased by over 20% compared to the rate of increase for electricity. And you can see that on an annual basis. And it's interesting, looking at this graph, that primarily that divergence occurred in the years 2013 and 14. And similarly, for the next three years, we anticipate a steep increase in the price of natural gas relative to electricity. But nonetheless, over the decade, those 
uh, compound annual growth rates that I quoted are what uh, E3 uh, estimates. So uh, the, the trend that I've uh, cited that will likely occur in the future, we can see has already been occurring in the past. And there, there's a suite of complex reasons for this, but part of it is ensuring the safety uh, of the infrastructure. Now, in this next graph, we look at a scenario in which building electrification proceeds at a high penetration rate, but there is a poor transition strategy in terms of the maintenance and delivery for those customers that remain on natural gas. And as a result, the price appreciation for a mixed fuel home, which is shown in yellow, diverges quite steeply from the all-electric home. Now, this is, this is not certain how this uh, will actually occur, but, but, th but this is a possible risk. I'd now like to reflect for a moment on the operations of our residential rental inspection program. And some of these photos actually pertain to electrical safety issues, but many of them pertain to gas appliances. And particularly, one of the top three is the seismic strapping on gas-fired tanked water heaters. So if we as other municipalities enact an electrification ordinance of some sort, it would take decades really to probably see a noticeable reduction. But, but these are pressing issues today um, with, with the gas appliances. So I, I just wanted to remind council of, of this in our operations. Um, so at this point, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Amy, Amy Ryder. She's the acting uh, director of policy at the Building Decarbonization Coalition. And I'm just going to advance that, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Council. Um, again, I'm Amy Ryder with the Building Decarbonization Coalition. Uh, you may not have heard of us. We're actually a fairly new entity, about um, just under two years old. And we are a membership-based, broad coalition uh, of many, many stakeholders with regard to buildings. So that includes <coughs> local governments, utilities, certainly our CCAs included, as well as manufacturers and builders. And so we look at how do we get carbon out of buildings. And what I wanted to share with you today really relates to uh, the company that you will keep if you continue to move forward with reach codes. Um, in particular, this has become a movement. And there are, uh, when we started, let's see, it is now February, so since February of last year, when the first local government took action, there are now 27 local governments in the state of California who have adopted um, some form of zero emission buildings, electrification preferred or uh, electrification only building code in their jurisdiction. And so you'd be among friends if you continue to proceed. And I just wanted to kind of drill down into what that looks like, um, because there are a few different options out there, and certainly staff will be presenting you their um, kind of suite of options, but there are lots of different approaches that cities have taken. Um, so this, this list gives you uh, kind of a glimpse into what folks have done. Um, number one here, the electric preferred and all electric buildings are the two options you'll be considering today. Um, all electric retrofit buildings actually is not terribly popular. If, uh, um, most cities are actually opting to go um, slightly more aggressively when it comes to new construction in particular. Um, many cities, uh, more than half, have chosen to expand solar requirements for commercial buildings. Um, and there's also the option of a in lieu fee if you were to do a electric preferred strategy where there's actually a, a financial penalty um, for anyone using mixed fuel construction. And then the one that gets all the press, are the, the gas prohibitions like the city of Berkeley and uh, now residential construction for San Jose as well, which has moved forward with a, a natural gas prohibition. Um, so that's, that's the one we hear about in the news most often because it is the most <coughs> uh, progressive, I guess you could say. Um, and then number five on this list is really about electric vehicle charging requirements and um, again, uh, I think about a third of the cities who have moved forward have had some additional requirements for electric vehicle integration with, with the built environment. Um, so here's Berkeley, very excited. 
Uh, they were the second in the state and they went out charging in the front. Um, but it's not just Berkeley. This is, this is a list um, that breaks down by type. So we have the, the infrastructure moratoriums, um, the all electric reach codes, which is definitely the largest group and the group that is growing the fastest and the electric preferred. One thing that this graph does not show you is that there's a time mechanism to this and electric preferred was much more popular when we started this effort and all electric has become increasingly popular, um, especially in the fall of last year when the lion's share of these were passed. Um, more and more cities are, are choosing to go all electric as the uh, education and awareness of what that looks like and how it operates in, in your homes, in your offices, in the buildings around you, um, it's becoming increasingly popular. And this is just a, that same data set broken down by how many jurisdictions. So again, the all electric reach is not quite half, but it's, it's a growing number. Electric preferred is certainly um, a large chunk as well. And then the, the Berkeleys of the world are, are the, the smallest group on this graph. So we don't yet have any jurisdictions in Santa Cruz County. But what we've seen across the state is when one jurisdiction in a region takes action, many other jurisdictions are likely to follow. So uh, thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer questions as we get to that part of the, of the day, but um, I'm curious to see what you all say. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. So I'd now like to spend some um, uh, opportunity here to look at the appliances, as we're calling the red circle in the earlier slide where we were adding up the increased electric consumption with newer appliances uh, and reducing the overall energy intensity of our built environment. How is that possible? In the top, we're going to look at the energy consumption of legacy natural gas appliances. 0.95, that's an energy factor. It means for the energy input, what is the effective rate of energy transfer for which the purpose of the appliance was created? So whether we're heating water or air, if we take the energy content of the fuel, uh, we can actually exceed 95, 6, maybe 97, uh, 0 0.95, 0.96, 0 0.97. So from an engineering standpoint, that looks quite extraordinary. Uh, we can we can do recovery of the uh, the combustion heat and pre-cool or the air or the water that's heading into the appliance, and so it looks like we've done a great job. There's two problems with that. The first is is that molecule for molecule, we have CH4 as our primary fuel. Methane becomes a CO2 molecule. It's changing the chemistry of our atmosphere and particularly the ability of our planet to lose infrared energy, thus causing a temperature rise. That's compounded by the problem that there's a whole <clears throat> set of supply chain impacts due to leakage. So we first have to find a mineral reserve where natural gas exists. Uh, we, we have to store it seasonally. We have to use large pipes to transmit it and smaller pipes to distribute it to our uh, users in the case of the utility. Now, the average leakage is somewhere between two and 5%. Let's call it 3%. So with a global warming potential of 32, that 3% now becomes 96. So we've we just about doubled the impact because we have very close to a perfect system, but there's a small amount of leakage, which is potentially uh, economically acceptable from the, from the aspect of delivering a product and having it uh, be a profitable operation, but in terms of the environmental impacts, uh, there's serious consequences. So even if we were to somehow achieve a perfectly 100% efficient natural gas appliance, those two other problems would remain. So that sets the stage for why we would want to pursue electrification, switch fuel away from creating new heat using a combustible fuel and use electricity. So now let's, let's go down to the bottom, to the electric resistance. So this represents a family of legacy appliances that use the current circulating through an electric circuit to heat either water or air. 
Now, there's always a portion of the circuit that has nothing to do with the heating for which the appliance was created, the control circuitry. We can never reach 100% efficiency. So le electric resistance, again, we, 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 we have this barrier. We can't really tunnel through this one, and we actually never achieve it. And as I mentioned earlier, with heat pumps, it's a complete new approach to what we're trying to do to create comfort or maintain comfort in our buildings. And that's to not create any new heat, but to move it around. And that's why it seems to defy logic, but the efficiency of a heat pump can exceed 350%. Why and how is that the case? Well, the electricity is being used to move heat energy from the inside to the outside or the outside or the inside. It has to do with the universal property of all fluids. When they condense, they release heat. When they evaporate, they consume heat. And so we can manipulate that with the proper engineering to create appliances as are now available commercially on a widespread basis to achieve our electrification goal. So before we move on, I, I want to talk a little bit about how a number can become a reality. I mentioned that between two and 5% leakage. So last week, while I was actually working on this presentation, I came home and my spouse told me, and I have something really important I have to tell you about the work that you're doing right now. And that morning when I had left, I had heard a, a saw blade cutting through the sidewalk across the street and into the street in front of my house. My neighbor was having their sewer line replaced because it, it was having a problem. And it turned out that the contractor heard a hissing noise after they removed some of the coverage. And it turned out that was a leaking gas line to, on our street. And our fire department shut down my street. And PG&E came out. And subsequently, they fixed that leak. And they, they went through. And they went through the whole street and looked for these things. So you know, the 3% can become not a number, but reality. <laughs> so just wanted to share that story with you. All right, so we're now going to take a look at what did the replacements for these appliances look like. We're going to start with the left column on space conditioning. So we have examples of residential and commercial heat pumps. Heat pumps can operate in the cooling or the heating mode. And we see a larger uh, form factor for a commercial unit that's conditioning a larger volume of area that's occupied. We move over to the second from the left. The column shows electric heat pump water heaters and a different approach in the bottom with commercial. Later, we'll see several examples, and I'll show you some of the differences on the water heating approach. As we move over to the uh, third from the left, we have cooking appliances for residential and commercial. In the case of uh, commercial or uh, kitchens, the electric steam cookers uh, are, are very uh, <clears throat> a readily available option for restaurants that are interested in electrifying either partially or completely their food preparations for their clientele. Finally, on the far right, we have clothes drying. With electricity, this is achieved through what we refer to as a condensing dryer. So rather than using heat to evaporate the moisture in our clothing that we've washed, we alter the humidity in the vessel in which the clothes are rotating, and we pull the moisture out. If we add a heat pump to that, it becomes even more efficient. And there are choices for both condensing and heat pump condensing dryers in the marketplace. So let's put this all together. What does it look like? This is an example of a New Valley home in San Juan, California. And in the top, we see the photovoltaic array on the roof of the new structure. On the bottom left, we see the condensing unit for the heat pump, which is either cooling or heating the interior air. And bottom center, we see a closer view of the heat pump water heater. And in the far lower right, we see a pie chart which examines the electric consumption by segment. So starting with the light blue and going clockwise, we have cooking, we have the heat pumps operation, we have the cooling mode as opposed to the heating mode of the same appliance. We then, in green, have the water heating. We have, in purple, all of our electric loads. And we have lighting and, finally, our food refrigeration. In this slide, we look at a very economical example of an appliance that's all electric that can, that can replace a very low-cost gas mount wall furnace. Now, in the past, a gas mount 
wall furnace was one of the most economical ways of heating a dwelling unit because it didn't require any ducting. And again, with this wall-mounted heat pump, it has a, a, a peak load less than a hair dryer on high, so 1,200 watts, and it uses 120 volts. So it's a very economical option for conditioning a space. It has an additional advantage over a legacy gas wall-mounted furnace in that it has a small electric fan which circulates the air actively. So it improves the thermal uniformity, the temperature gradient, if you will, from top to bottom or left to right of the rooms being conditioned. <coughs> in this slide, I'll spend a moment taking a look at different heat pump water heaters. The four product offerings on the, on the right, so excluding the, the left unit, it's labeled as sand and CO2, these are all hybrid heat pump water heaters. So they provide a backup circuit. If it gets extremely cold outside, we can no longer operate in the heat pump mode and we switch to electric resistance, which was what I was talking about earlier, the legacy. Now, in the last four to five years, heat pumps that are hybrid have improved tremendously in terms of the, the temperature at which they can operate in terms of exterior temperature and still remain in the heat pump mode. The best of all of these, however, is the heat pump on the far left. It uses a different refrigerant referred to as R744. What's remarkable is it's actually CO2 that's taken out of our atmosphere. So not only does it have the highest performance to the, to, with the coldest, coldest ambient temperature, at the end of life of this appliance, it has a null environmental impact because we're all already creating medical grade oxygen or nitrogen or other exotic gases and have to liquefy the components of our atmosphere. So here there's a new market for liquid carbon dioxide as, a, as the highest possible performance refrigerant for an electric heat pump water heater. Now there's an additional advantage of the Sandin in that it's one of the few product offerings that come in two sizes. So if we have a very constrained mechanical room and an all-electric design might potentially be adding cost, the Sandin comes in both a 43 and 83-gallon offering. And you know, it, it's just that this particular company has all of those advantages. Obviously, the city does not endorse any manufacturer model. It turns out that in Japan, Sandin has nearly half a dozen other competitors that are using the same type of refrigerant uh, but they're, they'll be hopefully coming to North America, so we'll have competition in these higher performance heat pump water heaters. Before I leave this slide, I want to reflect, it's, it's quite interesting, the American Gas Association has published its own study on building electrification, and some of the peculiar assumptions in that study are that electric heat pump water heaters don't have the performance of the models that you see here uh, before you, and that they switch over to the electric resistance mode at a much higher ambient temperature and ignore entirely the new family of offerings such as the R74 on the far left. So some of the conclusions of that study, as you might imagine, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, challenge some of the benefits that we're telling you today. But I just wanted to, to mention that, uh, you know, there's, there's other studies out there and, and some of the assumptions uh, might be questionable. This, uh, how, many, how many folks have seen these, these, these labels before? Anyone, anyone else in the audience? Okay, I got a couple folks there. So this is a, a federal certification for appliances. As it, as it turns out, water heaters have been receiving this appliance for several years. It turns out that dryers have just uh, been eligible to receive this. What's interesting here, this gas appliance is, you'll notice that on the, uh, the bar graph, it's all the way over uh, plugged onto the far left, so it's one of the most efficient possible gas appliances, and yet the electric is still has a lower cost. So you can see the Energy Star label here on, on the lower right. It's there's a little uh, arch with the the black uh, square and a star. J.R. Killigrew mentioned one of the challenges with our existing built environment, and and some of the incentives that Monterey Bay Clean Power is considering. Uh, surrounding electric service panels. So there are some innovative product offerings that can allow the existing built environment to transition and not trigger that by sharing the load so that there's an active 
uh, governing circuit so that we don't exceed the amperage rating of our, of our existing buildings. So there's some very clever enabling things that can help us with this transition. The focus primarily today is on the newly built environment, but I did want to share this. Here are the dryers that I was talking about earlier. Some of them use a heat pump with the condensing approach and others are purely condensing. And finally, I want to show this picture of a resort. It's an Oceanside Resort, and its pool and its spa are heated with a heat pump. So it's not only an all-electric resort, but that, that specific amenity for uh, its guest clientele was achieved with an all-electric approach. So with that, I would like to invite Taylor Darling of Santa Cruz Green Builders to share a very valuable perspectives from uh, someone who's a uh, project manager and, and working with plans our city's approved and actually creating structures and, and your take on electrification, the challenges and the benefits. Yeah. Thank you, Kurt. My name's Taylor. How's everyone doing today? Uh, so I'm a builder and we actually put these technologies into our homes. And so I'm kind of here to give you a little presentation on the nuts and bolts, how it actually works. We've built three all electric, well, two all electric homes and one all electric ADU. So it's not rocket science. It's actually fairly easy. Um, the technology is all here, as Kurt just showed with the, the water heaters. The heat pumps are, are really the big item there. And the technology is not that new, it's been around a long time. Um, they were installing heat pumps in Japan and Europe long before the US, and we've been installing heat pumps for about 12 years. So um, it's, it's tried and true technology, and it works. And <clears throat> there are plenty of subcontractors in town that install them, so it's, it's pretty easy. Um, I'm going to give you a, a couple examples of how in, in one of the ADU, the ADU that we did that was all electric, how we were able to do that. Um, we did a solar hot water heating system that preheated the uh, heat pump water heater. And that, that can be a solution that can even increase the efficiency more um, just by preheating the water going into the tank style heat pump water heater. Uh, you can do that on, on any system if you've got the space to do it, and that just makes it way more efficient. And a lot of times you don't even need the heat pump feature to turn on. And then um, we did uh, two mini splits, which are smaller heat pumps that are used to heat smaller spaces. They're ideal for ADUs. Um, the only downside to them is that they have this interior head that's kind of like this wide plastic head that some people don't like, but you can hide them creatively and make a bookshelf around it or something like that. But um, you were mentioning efficiencies for water heaters that are like 3.5. So it's, you know, the efficiencies for the heat pumps are uh, the, for space heating, for air heating is about the same. It's about 3.5. So that's 350% efficient versus, um, you know, the best condensing gas water heaters that we've been putting in are 97% efficient. So the, the jump here is enormous, 350 to 97%. So um, huge, huge gains in efficiency by, by doing electric. And then we've been adding solar onto our homes to also power these, these appliances grid tied solar arrays. So we do, you know, you draw from the grid at night when the sun's not out and you give back during the day, right? So um, that basically makes these houses just zero out if you size them correctly. And then for for cooking, a lot of people are, are kind of hung up on on the cooking, losing your gas to cook with because people love gas flame to cook on. I think it's um, it's in our, our DNA or something to cook on flame. But um, 
The induction cooktops are really great. They're very efficient. They are the really the best of both electric and gas. They're more powerful than gas, and they're uh, very easy to control. It, it's basically a, a glass surface. I don't know if you guys have seen these, but it's a glass surface with an electric, uh, an electric magnet that flips the polarity, and the, um, the iron molecules or atoms are flipping thousands of times and creating heat in the pan itself through re electric resistance. So it's, it's a pretty amazing technology. You're able to get a lot more efficiency when you're cooking and you're heating the pan only. The heat with gas mostly goes around the pan. But um, they're, they're really nice to cook on. Uh, they're, they're more powerful. They're more controllable than gas. They've got Know, 20 different like heat settings so um, you can boil water in 30 seconds a cup of tea or something so they're really really nice actually the other big hang-up that people have is uh, with going all electric is losing the, the gas fireplace that's a that's a big one and um, that's a big one for me too I, I understand that like it's having a, a gas fireplace is pretty nice to, to have that source point of heat but I think um, there's already some decent electric fireplace options out there if you're looking for like a radiant source of heat and people will get creative if this becomes the, you know, this is the future. So um, one day there's gonna be like a TV screen of a fire with blowing heat or something, right? I mean, people, people are gonna come up with these things. So um, the other house that we built was a large house. It was, you know, good size house, 2,400 square feet. Um, the whole house has a pretty normal forced air heating system, but with a heat pump heater and a heat exchanger inside that forced air heater. So you basically got the big outdoor kind of fan that you guys have seen more in commercial buildings, but you, you hide it somewhere and that brings the, the heat in through the coils, and then there's a heat exchanger within the, the forced air heater that distributes the heat out through the ductwork into the house. And that's a pretty easy approach. It's pretty uh, easy for the, the contractors to install. It's not that different from conventional systems. There's just a couple extra steps, and this is already the main way that commercial buildings are heated and cooled. So it's, it's just kind of applying more commercial technology to residential. Um, electric dryers, uh, we put them in, in all these, of course. Um, the heat pump dryers are, are definitely better. Even just a regular electric dryer can work too, um, or just putting your clothes out on the line. Um, more solar on this house. We, we, we did about eight kilowatts on this house to offset um, larger house, larger needs, and uh, they've got a electric car as well. Induction cooktop, all LED lighting. This, that's something that we do in, in every house that we build, all LED lighting. That's a really easy one. Um, LEDs use one-sixth the amount of energy of incandescent light bulbs. And then Energy Star appliances are really easy to buy these days. So um, basically every manufacturer mostly produces Energy Star appliances these days. So um, yeah, those were a couple example <laughs> homes that we've done um, as far as what appliances we use and how to achieve it. And it's also pretty easy to do a few extra things when you're building the house that don't cost a lot and reduce the overall load on, on um, the solar, uh, like the heating and the heat pump heaters. For instance, if you wrap the whole house, all the walls in um, an inch of rigid insulation or even two, you know, two inches is even better, that significantly reduces the amount of energy you need to produce. 
I wanted to talk a little bit about the cost implications. You, you gave some rough numbers about um, potential savings for not doing gas. And in our own work, we've seen those, those numbers are, are really similar to what we've seen. Um, for not doing a new PG&E tap-in underground in the street, you save, um, well, including the trenching to the house and, and the, the plumbing to the house for the gas, um, and not doing the, the gas piping in the house, you save between $12,000 and $20,000. Um, that's based on projects that we've done. And so that savings you can put right back into other components that will be a little bit more expensive. The heat pump water heater, the heat pump space heater, um, are, they are more expensive than the gas counterparts. And so you're gonna spend an extra six to $8,000 um, on those appliances. In most cases, you know, depending on the size of the house and everything, but um, that's a good ballpark number. And then the stove, your you know, induction cooktop is going to cost about a thousand dollars more than a, its gas counterpart. Um, so overall, what we've seen is that you save about five to ten thousand uh, dollars by not doing gas at all. And you can put that savings directly into a solar array that will make you money over time. So um, as far as cost, I don't, I don't think there's a cost burden to, to go all electric. And I think it makes sense for people. It's an investment that pays off. Um, some challenges that, that we have seen. Um, one is in order to get plans approved, there's a step that you have to take which is a Title 24 um, energy modeling for all new homes. And that's a, it's a California state law to do the modeling. And um, it has penalized electric, even heat pump, very efficient appliances. So um, there is a new code cycle that just started um, January 1st, and it supposedly doesn't penalize the heat pumps as much. Um, I think that was like legacy stuff that was in there when heat pumps were not very good or something many years ago. So hopefully that's gonna change because that's really been the main reason that we don't do all of our homes all electric. We basically do as much electric as we can and then we do um, high efficiency gas water heater and furnace for most of our projects because Tile 24 number, you get a huge credit if you do gas appliances. So that to me is the, the biggest roadblock to, to have everyone do all electric homes. There's really not much reason not to do it. And so um, I'm an expert in the, the Tile 24 modeling and it's, it's pretty complicated. So I, I know it's supposed to have improved um, January and we haven't done a, a new home that was permitted with the, the new code yet, so we'll see. Um, another challenge is for homes that will be built um, in the trees, you know, in the forest with, with shading. Um, to do all electric means that you can't do solar. Um, there's a lot of new options coming up, some I think are, are happening now where you can buy into like community solar. But uh, for those people that are in shady areas and <clears throat> or if your roof just does not, is just so many angles that you can't do solar, um, you will spend, you might spend more on electric uh, than if you had gas. but. As Kurt showed, the, the gas prices keep on going up, and um, you know you're still going to spend money on on gas. So um, it's not a it's not a huge burden, but that is something that I can see as being a little bit of a challenge is just dealing with the 
some, you know, they're around here up in Felton and Van Loma and Boulder Creek. There's a lot of big trees, and a lot of people will not be able to do solar. So you can still do all electric, but then you're going to be basically forced to buy from PG&E, or perhaps you could buy into one of these community electric programs. Um, another challenge that I see is some of these technologies are still fairly new, and um, we've had a few issues with um, the heat pump water heaters. Those are the newer ones. The, the heat pump space heaters, um, are they've been around longer. They're better. We haven't had issues with them. But the water heaters, I think that's just, you know, they're still working out some kinks there. But they're, they're pretty good. Most of the ones we've, we've put in, we haven't had issues with. And... Um, yeah, just one last kind of piece of, um, well, just a reflection, I guess, is that right now high efficiency wood fireplaces are still allowed, and it seems like uh, part of this would be possibly outlawing them completely, which I'm not sure I'm a proponent of necessarily. They they are dirtier, you know, fireplaces emit a lot more uh, particulates and they're, they don't burn as clean as natural gas fireplaces and that's why natural gas, part of the reason natural gas has become so popular. But um, that just seems like that needs to be figured out a little bit and maybe there should be an exception still for them because uh, one of the things with green building is like building and resilience and if there's going to be all these power outages potentially for a while um, you know, for people to be able to have some source of heat with a high efficiency <coughs> wood fireplace could be something that you'd want to give them. Anyone have any questions for a builder? Thanks, Taylor. We do have two other folks that we would like mm -hmm. to speak, and then we can certainly open up the conversation mm -hmm. to questions. Is that all right if we just wait? Thank you so much, Taylor. We appreciate it. Thank you, Taylor. And we will also share with you some of the points that Taylor made are uh, in the options that we'll be presenting to you. Uh, for example, uh, uh, fireplaces is not something that we're looking to regulate. So we will give you more clarity on what that looks like in just a moment. I next want to invite up um, Pete Kennedy from Bright Green Strategies. Um, he's going to give you the designer and hers Raider perspective a little bit different uh, than Taylor from Santa Cruz Green Builders. And I'll ask you, Pete, if you wouldn't mind keeping your, your comments to under five minutes. And then we have Rob Nicely from Carmel Builders also. No problem. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. <laughs> um, walking in, I was like, oh, this is great. All of Santa Cruz can agree on this. The climate stuff, the environmental we always always agree so that was a nice feeling for me um great news the title 24 software is fixed this is what i do in my day job and essentially the state switched from energy to carbon the minute they did that it became very clear that you can't keep burning natural gas even really efficiently and meet any of our climate goals i mean the graphs are amazing with this technology and without it so um, that was really good news. It's a game changer. Um, what we're working on now in our office, we do about 40% affordable housing, capital A subsidized affordable housing. So I was thinking of a couple projects I've worked on. Um, one is the Riverwalk Apartments. That was five or six years ago. It's right down by Bank of America. And that one has a huge solar hot water system, which is not what we're talking about. That's a pretty good solar technology relies on a lot of moving parts, a lot of pumps. It's great, it's better than nothing. But I remember the plumber out there commissioning that system for like a week, you know, getting everything working, getting all the parts to talk to each other. And it works, it's still there. It saves about half the total energy of that building. Um, so that's what, for affordable, this all electrification does is replaces all that with solar panels and electronics that are much more reliable than a hokey, you know, old solar thermal system. There are still places for solar thermal. It does offset gas, but um, that's what I was thinking about. The second project is actually in the county, but it was St. Stephen's Senior Housing. It's out by the church there. It was a great project. That's half and half. You know, you have little, you don't need much heating and cooling, so there's little PTACs, they're called, in the units. 
And we had this huge roof and you had to give half of it over to the solar thermal. So um, I can speak for our affordable clients, Midpen, Eden Housing, all the people we want to be building in this town. This is not only a great idea for carbon, saves money too. When do developers ever get anything that saves them money? I mean, it's just unheard of. So the numbers on the next affordable project, 1500 Capitola, looking to be about a 30% cost savings by skipping the gas. That's great. That's direct money. It goes right back into the project. Um, what else can I say? Um, for the single family homeowners, I think it's important to keep in mind this is a new construction thing. So, you know, it's your one big chance to invest in a new house that will be there for a long time. A lot different in retrofit or existing. And I appreciated that the proposed policy kind of made, you know, set those lines and treated the different sectors differently. It's a big difference. I mean, I have a gas fireplace in my house and it's our sole source of heat. And, you know, I hate the bill, but we crank it up in the winter. So we need to be reasonable. Um, the other thing I've studied and to finish up here is all the other Bay Area jurisdictions in classic California fashion. Everyone got this idea and just started passing laws really fast. <coughs> And it's been really cool to see what different jurisdictions are doing. First, Berkeley, nice and pure, just outlaw gas. Um, and then I believe Menlo Park in Atherton left an exemption for your big gas stove, you know, which tells you something about Menlo Park in <laughs> Atherton. Uh, San Jose has a really good model. They, they did a really good job with it, in my opinion. And so I'm happy to see that this uh, follows that, that um, approach to electrification. I don't see any downsides. I'd say vote, vote it in as quick as possible and let's build some housing that's going to get cleaner every day it's open because the grid is getting cleaner and cleaner. Thanks. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Pete. And then finally, I'd like to invite up uh, Rob Nicely from Carmel Builders. Rob not only does uh, all electric, but passive house design and has really been um, an advocate in our region for these uh, electric reach codes. Hi, everybody. Um, just want to say I really appreciate the opportunity to be in this room at this time. It's really a pleasure to be in a room where this is being contemplated. And uh, yeah, I, I'm a general contractor. I've been in building trades for 35 years. The last 20 something years I've been a general contractor in this area and for about 20 years I've been doing my very best to understand what is reasonable behavior in the trade of building uh, things. And um, so Tiffany said it in the beginning, but just to reinforce a point, um, if you believe in the IPCC and the United Nations uh, environmental wing and the reports they put out, then per the 2018 gap report, what it says is, is that if we want to have a 50-50 chance of avoiding climate catastrophe, we need to drive down greenhouse gas emissions globally by 55%. And then I listened to a talk by a guy named Ed Masria, who's, who's uh, the founder of Architecture 2020. And he said that 50-50 is not a very good, there's nothing to be proud of. And what we should really be shooting for is a 70% chance of avoiding climate catastrophe by driving down climate emissions by 65% globally over the next 10 years. So that's the backdrop of what we're dealing with. And um, I've, I've thought a lot about this and I spent a lot of time studying and trying to have some facility and what that means, what a person should go out and do if you believe in that. And um, broadly speaking, there's three parts to it. Electrification is the first, and it's probably the low hanging fruit. Uh, extreme efficiency, or in other words, driving down the demand for energy in the built environment. And then embodied carbon, which is sort of the new kid on the block. And it's the thing that people are thinking about the most right now, but by and large, uh, people that think about this a lot more or less agree that we're not going to make it. We're not going to avoid climate catastrophe unless we deal with those three things. So the state of California has, has come to the conclusion that the easiest and quickest thing to do is to focus on electrification. And I certainly agree with that. Um, in the built environment, the things that use the most, that create the most greenhouse gas emissions are 
water heating and space heating and cooling. And um, then there's other things that are smaller contributors. But the upshot is, is that um, heat pump appliances are work phenomenally well. And I, I've been doing residential construction for a long time now, and, and there's, no, there's not a lot of pushback to using a heat pump appliance. Nobody cares where their heat comes from as long as it comes from somewhere, as opposed to uh, Taylor was pointing out that it's a lot harder to talk a person out of their gas uh, cooktop, and um, there's the issue of fireplaces. But the, I've been swapping out um, combustion appliances for heat pumps in both space heating and water heating for about five years. It's very easy to do. They're, um, uh, the appliances are on the market that are of sufficient quality that you can do that in good conscience. And really, the only thing you have to concern yourself with is that you're going to need to bring, make sure there's adequate electrical supply. So you might need to run a new circuit. And then there needs to be enough air around them that there's some place for them to grab that energy. So sometimes if the appliance is in a closet, you need to put a louver door on the closet. But, but we're not talking, as somebody said already, then there's nothing about this that's rocket scientists. These are very, very simple things to do. And I've been, again, I've been doing uh, construction since actually my pre-teens, if the truth be told. And um, we are, uh, we, it's hard to get us to do anything new. <laughs> I've spent the last 20 years uh, as a general contractor. I basically run a preschool of sorts and um, trying to get people to do anything that's not the most common thing is not, is not easy to do. So what, what you're proposing or what one would have to do to create an all electric uh, built environment, these are not complicated things and the, all the infrastructure is out there already. It's just a matter of implementing. So um, like I said, water heating and space heating are two big things. Um, time of use does matter. Um, there is in the big electrical grid, uh, there is, there's, you guys probably already have, know about, there's, there's a peak demand in the evening where the dirtiest power is made. And so efficiency, which is one of the other parts of this, uh, is about driving down demand and consequently uh, load shaping or decreasing that peak demand so that on aggregate and, and the grid we're on is the Western states grid, um, there's, there's less dirty power being produced. So there's, there's you know, there's, we have to deal with all these things. But um, with regard to uh, electrification per se, um, I sent some stuff to Tiffany. It's about an exercise we went through with the city of Palo Alto a couple of years ago, and basically we partnered with them. Oh, I didn't mention uh, a few things, but um, I'm the past president of Pasvals California, which is an industry group that is uh, associated with Passive House International, again, a group that is, focuses on energy efficiency. And um, we partnered with the city of Palo Alto in 2018 to help them uh, incentivize the use of heat pumps. And at that time, actually all the manufacturers that Kurt showed, showed up and uh, brought their products and talked to the community about what it would take to uh, switch over to their products. And something that I think is relevant for this group is that um, the manufacturers relayed that um, if it's your intention to incentivize, and that's the way that you're, one of the ways that you're gonna get people to do this, you need to have an incentive that runs through the distributorship. In other words, nobody ever wakes up in the morning and goes, this is a great day to buy a new uh, water heater. What happens is their water heater breaks and then they call a plumber and the plumber goes to the parts house and buys a new water heater. and in, if you let things play out the way they would naturally play out, they're gonna go get another gas appliance and slap it in and that will be their water heater for the next 10 years. So if you can create an incentive program and have uh, the people at the distributorship, and in your case, you have a Ferguson's and a Slakey Brothers, and I don't know, uh, uh, Taylor probably knows better than I do. I know that everyone uses Ferguson down where I live, but um, here it could be one or the other. But that's where everyone's buying these appliances from, all the plumbers and sheet metal guys around here. So if you had a, a program where 
uh, you were involving the distributor and they were the ones that actually would fill out the paperwork and send in to get the incentives rather than asking the plumbers and sheet metal guys or the homeowners who uh, um, Energy Upgrade California when it came out showed us that no homeowner or general contractor is ever gonna fill out any paperwork if it means that it's gonna cost them money or time. So, so that's something that I would definitely uh, suggest. Um, yeah, so um, probably the main thing is just if you have any questions, I I have done both new constructions that are all electric. I have, at this point, I'm, I finally, after 20 years of sort of beating my brains out in the last year or two, I finally have clients that are coming to me wanting both very energy efficient buildings and all electric buildings, which this is the first time that's ever happened and it's really, really a good sign. Um, but I've done uh, both new constructions and retrofits. I don't, there is, anytime you're retrofitting anything, it's more complicated than when you have a nice clean slate. But I don't think you should be afraid of retrofits. It's not, at the end of the day, this all just boils down to a certain amount of work and um, conceiving of what needs to be done, although a little bit more complicated in a retrofit situation. It's not fundamentally different. It's just, a little stickier, but that's true of everything when you're when you're renovating a building rather than uh, uh, building a new building. But the thing to bear in mind is is during this period, if you buy into the idea that we need to do a lot of things right and be very aggressive over the next ten years, most of the building stock that's going to be in service during that time already exists. So you can't really not consider the existing building stock. We need to think about both of them. I think that's everything I can offer and obviously more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Rob. We really appreciate it. Now, um, we recognize that we're behind schedule. I just want to acknowledge that fact. Yet we are to the part where we would like to share with you what the policy options are that we would like for you to consider and what our recommendation as staff is that really takes into account all these conversations that we have had um, and I think gives you some really good options that are aggressive on greenhouse gas emissions. So Kurt's going to take you through that and we're going to finish up with sharing with you the rest of the timeline and the outreach that we've done. and we can hopefully get through that in about 10, 10 more minutes. Thank you, Tiffany. So before we go into the slides, I want to talk a little bit about what we're going to see. We're going to see flow charts for two options. And for those same two options, we're going to see a tabular presentation of the data with a little more detail. And we'll also briefly discuss some other options that we eliminated and why. And then we'll move on to the comparison between the options for greenhouse gas emission reduction, and we'll also look at impacts to the operations by segment of planning, building and planning division. Uh, so that's sort of just prepping you on, on trying to move through this. So here we have the flow chart version of option A. Option A consists of two legal instruments, a prohibition of all new natural gas infrastructure, along with an electric preferred energy reach code. And I'll talk a little bit why about there, why there's two of those. But let's first of all follow through this flow chart from left to right for the process for an application for a new, uh, the construction of a, a new newly built construction. So from the far left square into the uh, feature just to the right of it, there's a determination if it's an exemption. Currently, the exemptions being considered would include a restaurant, a new facility that utilizes industrial process heat, an additional dwelling unit that is less than or equal to 750 square feet, or a new structure that would be contrary to public interest uh, to pursue an all-electric approach. So if we answer this question as a yes, we move up or infeasible. or infeasible, and we move up to the right, and they're allowed to build a mixed fuel, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, so continue to use natural gas which would be a code compliant design to the 2019 energy code. If moving back on the other hand, the answer is no, it is not an exemption. All of the applications for building permits would create a all electric design. And as we move into the vertical rectangle on the right side of this slide, there are various requirements of the basic 2019 energy code. If we move to the top part for residential, there's a difference depending on the height of the structure. 
if the structure is greater than three stories, solar is not required. If it's three stories or less, it's, it's built to the code compliant all electric case and that includes solar. And I, just very briefly to reflect on Taylor's comment, there is an exemption if the solar access is less than 70% than it would otherwise be without shading from trees or adjacent structures or geological features, there is an exemption. So the code already covers some of those worst case scenarios. Now moving down to the bottom of this rectangle for non-residential, again, if it's not an exemption, the applicant would submit an all electric design and it would be built to code with no extra efficiency requirement, no PV would be required. Now we're going to look at the same option A in a tabular format and discuss in a little greater depth the, the, the two, uh, two things that are going on in terms of legal instrumentation. So if we move from the left column to the prohibition, we see again the requirements. The prohibition would likely, uh, this would be in Santa Cruz Title VI, Health and Sanitation would pertain to newly constructed buildings. Moving down to the covered buildings under the prohibition, uh, it would be those new structures that could either apply directly for a building permit or had uh, a, a uh, interaction with our current planning, and then in any ADU that would be greater than 750 square feet. Exemptions that I mentioned earlier would include a determination of infeasibility. All existing buildings with alterations or additions would be exempt if the structure was contrary to public interest to pursue all electric, if it utilized industrial process heat, or if it was a restaurant, or an ADU less than or equal to 750 square feet, it would be exempt from the prohibition. Now, if we draw a line through the center of this tabular presentation of option A, there are two legal instruments. On the left, the prohibition eliminates the choice of fuel. On the right, there is a requirement for higher efficiency if mixed fuel were still pursued. And you might ask, well, why is that the case? So in the existing pre-draft for the prohibition, there is a legal clause referred to as severability. What that means is that if any legal challenge were to succeed in, de in the determination that that prohibition or part of it was uh, legally uh, challenged successfully, that the remaining portion of the prohibition would be in place. But what we've, we've actually done here is we've improved the severability by creating two legal instruments. On the left, the elimination of fuel choice. On the right, if that were challenged and overturned, all, all our work would still be in place in terms of quantifiable emissions reductions by having the, perf the electric preferred reach code. So in the electric preferred reach code, the choice of fuel is preserved, but higher efficiency standards are required for mixed fuel buildings. So in a sense, there's two lines of defense here. There is an option A, the, and we'll see this later with the emissions reductions, the greatest impact on emissions from the newly built <coughs> environment, but also legal defensibility and sort of a second line of defense with the electric preferred reach code. Now, before I move on to option B, quickly, I just want to mention on the far right, we have our city's green building program. Some of the things that we've put in place last month help designers create structures that are ultra efficient and that can participate in something known as load shifting. And in the case of some other utilities, qualify for lower electric rates by making the envelope extremely efficient so it can coast through temperature extremes without using energy to cool or heat. Also, we have in better intelligence with regards to the hot water distribution system. It's almost a no cost to create this at the design phase and the homeowner benefits from minimum electric energy wasted heat water because the storage of the hot water is centrally located. And there are many other examples where the green building program would help the architect or designer building professionals actually design and create and install these systems that would optimize the electric design. So I now would like to move on to option B. And we're first gonna look at option B in a tabular format. There's no longer a prohibition. So starting on the left, we're moving through a box which determines if there's an exemption. 
In the case of option B, the exemption remaining is the additional dwelling unit less than or equal to 750 square feet. If we determine that that, that is the, the scope of the application, it's exempt, the applicant can build a co-compliant mixed fuel design. If it's no, there are two choices, doing an all electric design or pursuing a mixed fuel design with higher efficiency requirements. And so now we're down at the bottom in the center row of blue. And we can see that this branches off above to residential and below to non-residential. The 2019 energy code has a new metric for low rise residential. So if we go to the upper right portion of this slide, we see that there's something referred to as an EDR margin. So we, we have a reference building going back to 2006, which has a score of 100. Our region, we would ask for 10 points less than that for low, uh, low uh, residential structures, three stories or less. In the case of residential structures that are four stories or higher, it's a different measurement. We would ask for 5% less of the energy consumption. And moving down to non-residential, it depends on the occupancy uh, of, or the, the design of the structure. For office or retail, it would be 10% less than the standard budget. And for all other occupancies, which include lighting and mechanical, 5% less. So I've gone quickly through this, and I want to add that in the case of the, uh, of the mixed fuel option, for those structures that don't require solar by the energy code, we would additionally have a requirement because of the continued use of natural gas and its environmental impacts of installing either solar on the roof or the payment of a carbon in lieu of fee based on the projected use of that fuel over the occupancy and life of the structure. So I've gone quickly, uh, but given an overview now in the flow chart for option B. So let's now move on to the tabular presentation for option B. You can see uh, second in from the left that the prohibition column is blank because we have just the electric preferred reach code that by the way, we've recycled from option A. And we have the requirements based on the type of structure and its occupancy. The numbers that I mentioned, 10, 5% less, 10% less. We have the covered buildings, we have the exemptions for the ADUs, less than or equal to 750 square feet. Also the same, as we mentioned, alterations and additions would be exempt. And finally on the right, the benefits that the green building program provided in option A are almost precisely the same. Some of them pertain to those measures which are only achievable in design. So, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a opportunity with, in the case of an alteration or addition that isn't covered by the, the code also to voluntarily shift fuels. So now I'd like to move on as I promised to the comparison for option A and option B on emissions reduction. Let's start on the left side of this bar chart. So this is a projection based looking back on the last three years of development in our city, looking at the mix of low rise single family dwellings and multifamily dwellings. We project 120 year units over the next per year over the next 60 months for 600 dwellings. So the energy intensity is specific by type, and so we've calculated and estimated emissions that would relate to all of those structures being built, and what would their emissions be over a year. Now this these graphs reflect what would happen after 2024 because the 120 units is an annual addition of dwelling units. So we've aggregated all this together so you can see the composite effect and compare that between options A and B, which we've proposed. Now, we've gone on to do sensitivity analysis for option B. What would the uptake be for those where choice of fuel is preserved? So in the second bar chart from the left, we have option B such that 80% continue to employ mixed fuel whereas 20% choose the all electric design. And you can see there's a considerable, but not quite a 50% reduction. In the second option for uh, the second scenario for option B, there's a 50-50 mix of all electric versus mixed fuel. And we can see there's, as would be expected, a, uh, 
a further increase in the emissions from that aggregate 600 dwellings that would be constructed over a five-year or 60-month period. And lastly, we get to the far right, option A. And because in the case of Monterey Bay Clean Power's generation mix, either entirely carbon-free or entirely all renewable, there are no emissions. So this is the, option A has the greatest impact. And I'd like to frame this. The average in the United States is that dwellings and buildings turn over approximately 1% per year. The climatic conditions in the city of Santa Cruz are such that wood frame construction has greater longevity. So it's that, that estimate is, is not quite correct for our zone, but it would take a, a considerable amount of time. So if we were to take this aggregate for 60 months and multiply it by five, that would you know, be impacting something less than 25% of our existing building stock if we would look at the aggregate emissions. So I'd now like to move on to my final slide, which looks uh, in the sense of a heat map. So in the pink, we see increase in activities by operational segment of building and planning. And in green, where we would project a decrease. So first, we're going to talk about current planning and compare that with option A and B. So for current planning and option A, there is an engagement with the design team at a very early stage and a request that the architect or designer have an all a fuel, a, a fuel gas free stamp on the cover page of their plans as they submit them so that, so that they've, as the designer or architect uh, of design, have uh, specified that on their plans as we intake that for submission. There are also potentially impacts in the public right of way and uh, in the potentially uh, the uh, floor area ratio based on the different land use districts in our city and, and those requirements. So a slight increase, similar with option B, a little bit less, uh, but both in both option A and B, there's an impact for current planning. If we move down to building plan check, and now in the column for option A, we are no longer doing plan check for the gas supply line and the distribution within the structure, so there's a savings. However, the electric distribution is more intensive, so there's a, potentially a slight increase in the plan check. The net might often be positive. I've left that as gray because there's, there's contrarian indications. Now, moving out to building plan check with option B, you recall that in the case of a mixed fuel newly constructed building permit application, the applicant can still use natural gas. The energy compliance documents must demonstrate either that 5% or 10 EDR margin. So there's, there's a slight increase in our operations on plan check for B. Finally, moving down to the last row, we look at our operations in building field inspection. With option A, new natural gas infrastructure is prohibited. We no longer do the field inspections verifying the safety and code compliance of the gas piping. So there's a moderate decrease. So in aggregate, the projected impact on the building and planning department operations uh, is lighter for option A. So considering the three points, the highlights that we covered, legal defensibility, the reduction in emissions from the built environment, and the impact in operations, my recommendation is option A. Okay, what does that look like? So we're rounding the corner. We just have two more slides here. Thanks for hanging with us. So obviously the outreach has been key on this work as we're um, hearing from builders and so forth. We've had one community workshop. We will be having a second one on February 27th after we get direction from you on which option to proceed with. We have our study session today. We will have our second developers roundtable also next week on February 26th. And Kurt and I have been spending every Tuesday morning from 8.30 to 9.30 um, at 11th hour coffee for drop-ins, random drop-ins uh, with tradespeople, vendors, designers, and builders. And we've actually had people show up to each of them so far. We will be doing that on Tuesdays um, until March 10th. We also will be doing some outreach to distributors and vendors as we're preparing um, uh, some resource guides in terms of the policy process, depending on the direction you give us today, we will be going to Planning Commission on March 5th for a hearing. 
And again, depending on your direction today, um, the earliest we can come back with a first ordinance hearing um, would be March 24th. Um, and then the second hearing would be April 27th. And we're also planning with Ecology Action for Earth Day, a building electrification expo at Earth Day down in San Lorenzo Park, where vendors can come and bring heat pump water heaters and other kinds of appliances um, to show that they're here, they're available. Um, and from there, uh, we will be submitting to the California Energy Commission for approval of any reach codes and then implementation. Uh, we will make recommendations later on when implementation should begin. So the final resources um, we already have available at this website, cityofsantacruz.com slash policy. We have a frequently asked question sheet that we are continually updating, including any questions you might have today. Our first community workshop slide deck and this slide deck from today will be going up. We also didn't reinvent the wheel. Berkeley's got a great fact sheet on electric induction cooktops and heat pump water heaters that we're promoting. And we have some other electrification resources um, on availability sourcing and so forth that are also in development. Oh, and, and I just, just very quickly, I overlooked, uh, I wanted to mention that there was a potential for an option C or D, which involved only a prohibition or only an all electric reach code. And the reason we passed over that is that in the case of just a prohibition, if there were a challenge, say a constitutional challenge to the removal of fuel choice and the prohibition was removed, the work of our staff would, would be entirely reversed. We'd have nothing as a, as a second line of defense. And in the case of the all electric reach code, although it's contained as an amendment to the energy code and their cost effectiveness studies that show the cost effectiveness of all electric design, still the same legal argument could potentially be made against an all electric reach code. And thus the options that were presented were a prohibition plus mixed fuel, uh, uh, plus electric preferred or electric preferred in isolation, the options A and B, which I presented. And with that, I know that's a lot of material that we've shared with you. We're happy to take any questions that you might have um, at this time, and then you can open it up uh, to public comment. Right. Council members, questions at this time? Council Member Crum. I was just wondering what kind of uh, pushback you that Berkeley and uh, Alameda and Morgan Hill and San Francisco and San Jose have received? Sure, so I, I can start that. So um, Berkeley did have a challenge, um, a legal challenge to their natural gas prohibition from the California Restaurant Association. They did not exempt restaurants, as we are suggesting. Uh, if you recall from one of the initial pie charts, um, cooking, the use of natural gas in cooking is a very low proportion compared to uh, space heating and uh, water heating. And so we feel in light of that and the uh, challenge against um, Berkeley that that would likely not happen here. I think there was something that happened recently with Berkeley. I don't know if Mr. Kandadi has followed that in terms of um, the, uh, the, whether that challenge will stand or not. I have not, but I'm happy to look into that. Question for Taylor, I think uh, 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 on that thing, what do chefs say about the electric versus the gas, do you know? If, if I might add, Amy Ryder also has an update on the Berkeley and, and then we can certainly uh, talk to Taylor as well. I just wanted to mention that. So I actually don't have an update on Berkeley, but there there have been a couple of legal challenges um, to the all electric codes as well that are uh, in settlement negotiations at this point in time. So, but uh, neither of the recommendations that staff have put forward with the exception of the piece that Berkeley is being challenged on have been impacted. And if you don't feel like you can answer that uh, about the, the chef's uh, argument in favor of um, gas over electric, is there something that they put forward like an argument? I, I would just say that um, I think that's probably a good choice to exclude it for restaurants because of the hardship for restaurants to try to find like large induction cooktops would be pretty difficult. The induction cooktops are mostly made for home cooking and I think chefs like cooking on them. But um, yeah, it's probably wise to um, exempt restaurants from the requirement. Thanks. And um, 
how much is the in lieu fee? Uh, is there a standard in lieu fee for opting out or? No, there's only one other jurisdiction that has actually adopted an in lieu of fee, that's San Luis Obispo, and we're still in the process of determining what that might look like to cover the therm's usage. Do you want to explain how uh, they referenced, um, I think, the utility and the cost per therm? Yeah, so in the past, the investor-owned utilities have had programs that their rate pace could, on a voluntary basis, offset the environmental impacts of the fuel that was, say, designed into their home that they were renting, a <coughs> rental unit. And so there's the usage actually from that rate payer's bills and then uh, some life cycle impact analysis uh, that follows the methodology that's used for the time-dependent valuation. And then, you know, a payment to the utility, which then uh, uses that money uh, to off, you know, through various offsetting programs. Thanks. We, ha we haven't, we haven't uh, looked at those models and come up with our own and, uh, and, numerical yet. And I would say part of that is due to we would like to see what direction council's interested in before developing right, that. Right, and I'll just, I'll just quickly mention. So in the, in the options that were presented, the electric preferred reach code was used in both option A and B. The development of the in lieu of fee would, would only be staff um, resources in the event you directed us to pursue option B rather than option A. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And um, the addition electric vehicle charging requirement, what was that? We are not requiring any additional electric vehicle charging as part of these two recommendations. However, do recall that um, the city did adopt through its parking ordinance, I would say back in 2018, increased requirements over code in that we required you actually install instead of just make ready um, electric vehicle charging spots. So we already have in a sense a reach code with respect to EV charging. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Looks like the Berkeley lawsuit was only filed in November, so it's probably premature to really figure out what the status is, but I can check in with their city attorney's office. Councilmember Matthews. I first want to say this was an amazing presentation. So much information in two hours, and thank you to all the presenters. It was a really great cross-section. Um, something, um, listening to all this, and I don't expect an answer right now, but just as this moves forward, um, I think you estimated something like 160 new units a year or something for the city. It was a number, something like that. Whatever it was, doesn't matter. One, but I think it was 125, so, so it's, whatever. So it's yeah. One, yeah, yeah, 120 units. Looking back in the last three years of development, working with advanced planning and our planning director, uh, we, you know, we made the most likely uh, projection. Estimate, yeah. Um, but of course, as some of the speakers mentioned, most of our housing here is older. And so the real potential is retrofit. And um, some people alluded to the fact that it's not impossible, but it's a little more complicated. And to me, just when we look at what we've done on water conservation, a lot of it is voluntary. It is extra expense. And so as, as you move forward with this, I'd be curious um, for guidance uh, and um, encouragement to for all those existing structures, um, how to take the next step. And particularly, I'd be curious, Monterey Power, I think you said you were launching an incentive program for retrofits. Correct. If you could just give us just a tiny description of how that would kick in, what you, what the reach is gonna be, et cetera. Sure, uh, thank you very much, Council Member. Um, Matthews, again, J.R. Killigrew with Monterey Bay Community Power. Um, so it, it's, a, it'd be a, it's a, gonna be a summertime program and we'll probably have incentives for uh, customers that are um, either Medical Baseline or Karen Farah and then uh, incentives for all other customers. So it'll be kind of income qualified. Um, we are gonna have a, uh, an initial tranche of money. I think it's gonna be about $300,000 collectively for uh, heat pump, hot water heaters, EV chargers, and then panel upgrades. Um, I would like to say that that money could get gobbled up very quickly, and then I can go back to the board and ask for more. Um, we had uh, something like $850,000 available for EV incentives to buy the cars. We only helped incentivize 24 vehicles. So we basically had that money carry over. So I think we're trying to calibrate to make sure that there's funding available for customers that take advantage and we'll have an outreach uh, plan developed to go after kind of especially the care and fair customers, medical baseline customers, folks that 
could possibly benefit from a, from a higher incentive level. So, but again, I think the point is, is we could certainly have a tremendous amount of dollars allocated for it, but if it's not going out the door, I'd rather kind of start small, be effective, and then once the market responds and says, hey, we need $2 million for this, then we have that business case. And we can certainly promote in conjunction with the marketing that MBCP does, which is quite extensive once those incentives do come out. And then also, again, just a couple things to, to put out there. I have an ancient house. <laughs> I try and upgrade what I can. Um, but uh, again, I'm thinking what we did on water and the toilet switch outs and that sort of thing. And, and a number of you mentioned the technology is there, but it's still kind of in the evolving. At least that was the message I got. Um, at least some aspects are evolving and just a uh, uh, help to the, um, the smaller consumer of these upgrades as opposed to a builder. Um, some credible information on reliability, on performance. Those are the questions we've asked on earlier um, improvements. Uh, that's just one more thing that gets people over the next step to take the plunge. And it's, it's probably as much just information um, as <laughs> financial incentive, but I, I think given our ancient housing stock here, or our older housing stock, these will be important in helping us exceed our goals. And then my this is actual question, um, uh, what happens in terms of reliability when we have these uh, pg e type events where people are out of electricity for several so, days? Excellent question. Before we answer that, I just want to quickly also mention in the green building program updates of last month, we used to have uh, a 10 points that was available for voluntarily building a zero net energy before it was required by code. Mm -hmm. And now for alterations and additions, if they switch to all electric or they can voluntarily go to zero net energy, mm -hmm. they would, they would. So, so I'm just showing that our voluntary program has already given mm -hmm. a, uh, an allowance for that. Now, uh, specifically, thank you for asking the question. This is extremely important. Public safety power shout, shutoffs, a great concern that uh, you know, critical systems in the home are not available for a protracted period of time. So first of all, for older gas appliances, there is actually uh, a pilot light that is using natural gas that's burning mm -hmm. all the time. So the heat that's available is available on instantaneous basis. You know, the, the thermostat on the water heater can turn on immediately. The, the uh, furnace can turn on immediately. Those are no longer allowed for new appliances. So, so, you know, if you if you lose your electricity and you, you're not able to restart the appliance because those ignitions are now not a pilot that's burning; it's an electronic ignition. So there's some misunderstanding around. Oh well, why why would should we switch fuel if we're going to be losing electricity all the time? Well, with electronic ignition, there's there's not a there's no advantage to having a mixed, a new mixed fuel design. And there's health impacts of that pilot and using the gas. Uh, one of the most uh, concerning things comes back to that medical research that I was talking about recently in the last five years. So if you were an expecting mother during a public safety power shutdown, you figure, oh, I'm just going to use my natural gas appliance cooking inside. And oftentimes, bearing the weight of the fetus, you can't get you don't want to bend over far to the to the inner row of burners you're going to be using the outer one so that uh, combustion byproduct is mixing more readily with the interior volume of the air so not having an electric exhaust right because the exhaust is not on so there's there's all kinds of as we as we drill into this more deeply um, yeah that actually though was not my question it was okay. if the if you've gone all electric and the electricity's off for four days. Um, we all know after pg and &E, a whole lot of people went out and bought generators, and <laughs> et cetera. So uh, system-wide, system <laughs> is that the um, kind of unspoken add-on to all of these? You go all electric and you have some kind of big Tesla battery on your house or something. Well, well, Council Member Matthews, I'd like to thank you for asking the question. We were just having this discussion this morning in our outreach. So. For those individuals that have critical home medical devices, there is a uh, there's a middle ground, which is 
you know, a small capacity KW, KWH lithium ion battery that can provide several hours, <coughs> depending on what the load is of those devices. So that, you know, it's not as if you are preparing for the public safety power shutoff with this tremendous generator or a solar system with, that's tied with a large lithium ion battery. There's, there's small portable devices if you ascertain for those loads that are critical during the public safety power shutdown for your household, you can scale that. So they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, uh, they are available, they're, they're not widely known of, but that is, that is an option that's sort of a, a middle ground. And in terms of, you say, the Tesla Powerwall and other larger battery storage, that is actually heavily incentivized right now by the state through SGIP, the Self-Generation Incentive Program, to enable that kind of backup. But again, I think the point here also is that regardless if you're on natural gas and electric or electric only, when you have a public safety power shutoff, you can't use either one of them. So I, I yeah. think it's important to remember well, that. I'm certainly not the only one that has these yeah. questions. So. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah. With, that's why we had the yeah. backup slide <laughs> ready. <laughs> one, one other uh, consideration on the public safety power shutoffs, and one of the features that we've incorporated in the green building program, and little known knowledge, is that solar inverters, string inverters, have, a few of them have the ability to provide power even when the utility grid power is shut off through an outlet that's directly on the inverter, up to 2,000 watts of critical load. So a small refrigerator, charging your cell phone, they're, they're made by one company in different sizes. So we're educating people about that through the updates in the Green Building Program. They may not work for everyone's. Our city's actually gonna be retrofitting some inverters to of this exact nature that I just discussed. Potentially, we, we applied for the um, state allocation for a public safety power shutoff grant, and that is one of the line items that we requested is converting some of our older inverters to these SMA inverters, which would give us a 110 <coughs> outlet to utilize in uh, public safety power shutoff. But we find out shortly if we got that grant. We have not yet. Other questions? Councilmember Watkins and then Brown and myself. Okay. Well, Councilmember Matthews asked a lot of the questions that I had, and especially in regards to how we're going to look forward in terms of the retrofitting of existing buildings. So I appreciate the questions and, of course, the presentation and all the participants. I guess my question would be um, maybe just more sort of topical in that if, if you're not ha so what would a all electric home with look like with a fire, no fireplace, a fireplace, just centralized heating? How, how does that work, given the technology was mentioned to not be there for, for sort of fireplaces? So again, this is just for new buildings. For new buildings, right. Um, I don't think that we are considering a fireplace unless it is the only source of heat and is fueled by natural gas. That would not be something that's regulated as part of either of the options that we've presented to you. So the prohibition does not specifically uh, prohibit the use of wood as a fuel only what is termed as fuel gas in the plumbing and energy code, which, which includes natural gas and manufactured liquefied petroleum, but not wood. Oh, okay. Um, but to, also to answer your question, when, when we have electric energy available, it's possible to create an appliance which very efficiently converts it to infrared electromagnetic radiation, or basically the light that we can't see the sun's light is 50% infrared. It's invisible to our eyes. We can create appliances that very efficiently convert the electricity into that same type and nature of light, the same warmth that we feel from a fireplace burning wood. Th those appliances are under development. Well, I have to say, um, going along with Kurt's stories about his home, I actually retrofitted in my house just over Christmas. It cost me $100. It's a heater and it ha it's electric plug-in and looks like a flame. It's great. Yes. <laughs> and it's amazing. fantastic. And you can do it with heat or without heat if you just want the ambiance. So I, I, I stand corrected that these appliances are, are out there and, and looking wonderful. I, I haven't seen one personally. Yes, That's they are. I guess my only other question would be, and then and maybe it's more of a comment or a suggestion. In, in terms of the equity piece, it's nice to know about the different incentives or options through uh, Monterey Bay Community Powers. But uh, those who um, have 
uh, means are able to access some of the different sort of retrofitting options as well as backup storage options, I think. I mean, generators are pricey. So as long as we're sort of just keeping an eye on that, I think that's really important to think about. Yeah, and I think a big piece to that also is advocating <coughs> to MBCP on the rate design oh. itself is an oh, important right. piece, and we continue to speak to Monterey Bay Community Power up about that. Thank you. So I just wanted to add on the affordable housing connection with electrification that one of the primary ways that low-income housing is financed in our state is through a little-known program that is administered by the state treasurer's office. It's referred to as a low-income housing tax credit. It's a competitive system. Developers in all the counties of our state apply uh, with a, uh, an admission form that's point-based. And that currently, that acknowledges ultra-efficient design like passive house and also solar. So really looking at the landscape of other jurisdictions doing something with electrification, we might be behind applying for that tax credit. Generally what happens is the tax credit's awarded to the low income housing developer, and then it's transferable to a savings and loan institution that might uh, then fund up to 70% of the cost of developing and building out the project. Councilman Brown. Yeah, thank you all for uh, the presentations. This was really great. I've, I've learned a lot. And um, thank you. I want to thank uh, JR for being here to talk about the Monterey Bay Community Power Incentive Programs. I have to say being on this board has been a really great experience for me. I've learned so much. And I'm going to have a hard time letting go of uh, the name, Monterey Bay <laughs> Community Power. But I have been. it's been pretty cool to watch it grow. And, um, so that is one, thank you. And then I also wanted to thank uh, Mr. Uh, Nicely for raising the question about uh, kind of following up on the retrofit mm -hmm. question, um, talking with suppliers. And so I'm wondering if that is something that's happening with your outreach ice. It is. So, okay, great. And then lastly, um, so we have these incentive programs through our own CCA. And I, we talked a little bit, Tiffany, about um, you know other ways to kind of leverage money. And I'm wondering if it sounds like <clears throat> the state is now getting out of the way uh, in terms of obstacles to doing these kinds of reach codes and um, certification for through Title 24. Are are there programs on the horizon with the state to provide some of those incentives as well? And if somebody could just tell us a little bit about that, it would be great. I'm not aware of other incentives. JR may be more on the pulse of this. I am not aware of other incentives that are uh, coming out for retrofits. However, one thing I will add is if you did indeed choose option B, which included the carbon and Lua fee, you could do as San Luis Obispo has done is that they were going to allocate the funds that came in from the carbon and Lua fee for retrofits, retrofitting existing buildings and incentives for new buildings. Because without any, if we took the natural gas prohibition, there would likely be no revenue stream in order to fund incentives that the city could make. So I think that's important for you to know. And I don't know if anyone else, yeah, Amy or anyone has a comment on uh, state incentives. Yeah, just I'll just have to mention the big one, which is uh, Senate Bill 1477. It's $200 million to electrification. Uh, not all of it's to new construction. In fact, most of it is for existing buildings. Um, it's going through uh, proceedings right now for approval and design of exactly how that money will be deployed and by whom. Um, so it's a ways off yet, but it's certainly coming. Do you have something you want to add? So again, uh, J.R. Killer, I, I did want to highlight, um, we also are <clears throat> um, seeking a budget amendment um, next month at the policy board to add a million dollars for residential resiliency. This, so that's to provide backup supply for medical baseline and care and fair customers in our service area. So that will be working with a vendor to hopefully provide either 100% of the cost covered or maybe 80 or 90% of the cost covered um, and be able to build up kind of micro scale battery backups to be able to power medical devices, key, key instruments in the home for a few days at a time. And in addition to that, we are establishing a revolving fund to support resiliency through the 
un uninterruptible power supply fund, we'll have $20 million available for the public sector. That's health care, uh, city and county governments, um, schools, as well as, um, yeah, those are the three. But we're trying to look at it from the full, full, full scope of the lens of what happens with PSPS. I would also like to encourage us to think that if PSPS does stop the public safety power shutoff, there are other events that can happen in life that we seem to have kind of been gobbled up by PSPS, but there are things that can shut down the grid as well. So we're trying to think about it as resiliency from that lens of like, regardless of whatever impacts the grid, we can deploy our resources to help the customers in the, in the central coast. Thank you, JR. So what he was referring to actually is a metric in past years before the beginning of public safety power shutdowns, the average interruption that a customer, say a PG&E customer might have experienced over an annual period was almost two hours in, in the most recent metrics. I'm gonna hold my comments until, and maybe open mm -hmm. the floor for public comment from the public. So if anyone wants to speak to us on this item, you can line up to the left and you'll have two minutes to address the council on this item. Step forward. Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. John Conway. I'm an environmental scientist, a resident of the city of Santa Cruz and the senior research analyst at the Romero Institute and Green Power. And first I would like to say thank you so much for your excellent presentation. That was a tremendous amount of research and work and I really appreciate it as a member of the community and as a scientist. Um, and I strongly encourage you to uh, adopt option A uh, that was presented, um, an all electric uh, or a natural gas prohibition with some exceptions, I think is the strongest proposal that was made today. Yeah. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon, city council members and community members. My name is Jocelyn Wolf. I'm a lawyer with the Romero Institute, and I would just like to second what John had to say. The uh, option A is the strongest proposal before you, and I would encourage you to vote that way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members and staff. Such a pleasure to be here. My name is Kirsten Liskey. I'm the vice president of community programs at Ecology Action. Our mission currently focused is less emissions. Since 1970, we've been a partner with the city to help make Santa Cruz a leading sustainability um, jurisdiction in the nation. We currently have the second highest urban bike ridership. As Cynthia mentioned, we have some of the lowest water use in the state. We have some of the highest recycling rates. The city has been a leader in what then becomes mainstream ways of doing business so our communities can thrive in harmony with nature. The future is electric, so adopting a reach code of some kind for building electrification is critical, and adopting the most assertive one you can for um, emissions reduction that is also a reasonable step that the community is not going to reject is probably the best course of action and it seems like both the options have been very smartly developed and because emissions reductions and the time sensitivity of that is so critical we'd strongly recommend the most assertive emissions <coughs> reduction option which is option A. So thank you and thank you to staff for b ongoing um, learning and this was a fantastic study session I learned a lot even myself. <laughs> thank you kindly. I'm Susan Cavallari, and I'd also like to thank everyone for all the work that has been done on building electrification. Um, I support uh, the option A. Uh, we have a climate emergency. Methane emissions are, um, methane in particular, is a very potent greenhouse gas, as was stated, and it's driving the loss of biodiversity and ultimately the extinction of most life on earth. We have a choice to change and we must change. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon, city council and staff. That was, was indeed an excellent presentation. Um, my name is Beverly Deschaux. I'm the president of the Electric Auto Association Central Coast chapter. So I like the Central Coast change. Um, and um, I, the 82% emissions coming from vehicles, 
is alarming to me. And so while I appreciate all the work with the buildings, I would like to see more happening with regard to supporting the trans transition to electric vehicles. And specifically, I'd like to see the city council uh, take a stand to have all only electric vehicles being bought as as any any vehicle that the city buys would be electric only and all except for backhoes are available in electric now and I'd be happy to consult with you if you need any more information about where to access them. Thank you. Thank you. Hi folks, I don't want to prolong the agony or, or maybe it's the joy. They were great presentations. It was really fun to listen to and appreciate everybody's contributions. Uh, I'm Joe Jordan from the West Side. I teach energy, in particular renewable energy at Cabrillo College. In fact, we've had Tiffany in to speak and we'll have to have Kurt come in next, uh, next fall. Um, yeah, it's a no brainer, seems to me. Um, you know, I'm something of an energy expert and the option A looks really tight and great and so highly recommend that you go for it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Is there any other member of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item? Okay. Seeing none, I'll bring it back. I just wanted to say that, um, echo my comments and appreciation for all the work that's been done on this. Um, I think it's, as it was expressed earlier, really important that we start moving towards, you know, reducing or continuing, I should say, um, our movement towards carbon reduction, given everything we know about um, the potential for climate catastrophes. And given that we've been doing a lot of work, I think we're continuing that tradition of moving in this direction of becoming a more sustainable city. So thank you all for the presentation. I think one of the things um, I would just like to comment is with regards to, I know it came up that there's some folks whose houses um, potentially um, are shaded or they won't receive enough light if they're solar. And I just wonder if there might be some point or some type of program that those people can enter into along, you know, further into the future that will help them offset those costs since they don't have the ability to have solar. And then one other thing to think about and consider is um, as we see new houses being built and as we see new developments, um, if those developments result in shading houses that have solar, what we can do as a city to make to offset those impacts of those residents who um, at one point might be you know receiving a lot of solar energy and then a new development comes in and, and it completely outshades them so um, I'll go ahead and take part of that question those questions thank you for those questions number one um, we do have a solar access uh, ordinance uh, already on the books I'm not <coughs> sure mechanically how that works and maybe Kirk or uh, Lee could speak to that, but that is in place. In terms of shading on buildings in an alternative, like a community uh, energy um, kind of uh, program, right now, community energy only works with virtual net metering, which means that you need to submeter with it on um, one site. There's a bug on your shoulder. Oh, there is a very large bug. Luckily, I'm not afraid of bugs. <laughs> Yeah, that was huge. Um, so right now, community solar isn't possible unless you can submeter on a site. We don't have a mechanism through our utilities to do that credit swapping across properties and accounts. That is something we certainly have been watching, though. There, I think there's been one place in California that's been able to figure that out, which was a jurisdiction that owned its own electric utility. But believe me, that is something I'm super interested in because I think we have a lot of people that would want to buy into and potentially benefit from community solar. So point taken there, I don't think we're quite there yet um, technology-wise and rate-wise. rate, rate wise. And then I had one other question as it relates to the PG&E power shutoffs. Um, would microgrids or the construction of microgrids, how could that possibly help offset those impacts? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, speaking to the incentives that Monterey Bay Community Power has coming out, the um, SGIP, the Self-Generation Incentive Program, there are ample incentives right now if you can develop the microgrid project. They aren't so easy to 
pick the put the pieces together. It's a it's a complex endeavor, but it's completely feasible. And that is one of the things that we also applied for in our public safety power shutoff city allocation grant is to be able to isolate our SCADA, which is the brain of our water system and communications, be able to isolate those loads and then microgrid that mm -hmm. as a critical facility. So definitely microgrids and battery storage helps in the case of public safety power shutoff. So I, I just add um, with regards to the microgrid uh, that Tiffany was talking about, when we combine an ultra efficient shell, meaning the exterior of the building with a microgrid approach, if we look at the entire project cost, the structure plus the microgrid assets being the generation and the storage, it becomes more cost effective because we can build an ultra efficient design. This is something that Rob nicely has done for under say seven or eight percent over what it would cost to create a co-compliant home. But then the co the reduced cost of the assets because that building can consume a fifth of the energy and in the case of now with this energy code maybe maybe a third still the entire project can be extraordinarily cost effective compared to conventional construction with larger batteries and larger solar arrays. So it's if you will the perfect um, uh, combination. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and if there's anything we can do to help support microgrids moving forward, let us know. And so I'll move, I'll go over to Council Member sure. Watkins. I'll just, um, I think this is, as been said, it's been a really great presentation, really informative. And I again want to thank all the presenters as well as our staff. I feel we're really lucky to have such a really high caliber engaged community and staff working on this. And I know we've been talking about having this before us, so it's a real pleasure to have it here today. So with that, I'll go ahead and move the recommendation um, to direct staff to prepare option A policies and proceed to adoption along the timeline outlined in the presentation. Second. All right. So we have... A motion made by Council Member Watkins, seconded by Council Member Glover to um, prepare option A that has been brought to us by staff. And if I could just add a possible suggestion, a couple of people mentioned legislation that's currently uh, in the in the process. And I think we'd probably all be interested in knowing what your priority legislation is so we could weigh in as a city and support that legislation as it moves forward. So if we could maybe add to this and uh, inform the council of key legislation that would support these objectives. Mm -hmm. Accepted. Yes. Do you have a question? Mark? Yeah, I do have a question just for the sake of the minutes and the motion. Um, option A policy, that, that language doesn't cover it for the minutes. Oh, you need more detail than option A? Yeah. How, how do we want to succinctly describe this? I was looking at that, but I couldn't. Uh, mm -hmm. all, all electric new construction, right? Natural gas prohibition. A natural gas prohibition. So, so it could be the so phrase. you don't want anything specific to a timeline? Sure, uh, then that would be bring it back on September 24th for, or I'm sorry, March 24th for the first hearing. Did you want something more specific than option A then? Did you want to know? Not it was the timeline. It was the timeline. Okay. Councilman okay. Matthews. And just for clarity, so some people don't freak out. It's natural gas prohibition with limited exceptions. Correct. Correct. Yeah, I mean, you might just want to put that. Sure. We'll go ahead and add that language. Councilman Crown. Could you say what the exceptions were again? I know it was um, restaurants. Sure, it's on the slide right here. It's restaurants, industrial process heat, ADUs less than or equal to 750 square feet, new construction that's uh, where natural, not having natural gas would be contrary to public interest or it would be infeasible. You're welcome. Okay. So is there any further questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thanks. Thank you, Council. Council Member Meyer. Really good Council presentation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, really good. Nice With that, given that this is our only agenda item today, we'll adjourn our meeting. 3.33, look at that. You did it. Uh, you're supposed to. Uh, email. Friday?